When I took time out to think about what I might say about Dahi, I went to his website, as one always does on these occasions. It's very full. There's an awful lot on it. He has achieved a great amount. But I decided that that wasn't what I was going to talk about, even briefly as I introduce him. I met Dahi many years ago, and what still strikes me every time I meet him is his pure vibrancy, his excitement about being on this planet at all, his inquisitiveness about anything and everything. He is not bounded by any walls. And I thought that in terms of the theme for our conference, which is sparking the imagination, that we could think of nobody better placed to spark everything and anything that goes on in our heads and what might go on in our classrooms moving into the future. So Dahi, if I may ask you to present, please. Thank you. First thing we do is we always make sure the technology is working. Second thing with age comes the sense of having to wear glasses. Don't be such a fool, Dahi, just do it. Okay, I can live with that. <laughs> it's a huge privilege to be here among <coughs> friends, colleagues. It's, I often sound like, I suppose, Mark Anthony, friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. <coughs> Spark the imagination. Um, I would have to say that in many years of earning grey hairs, this has probably been the most difficult keynote I've ever been asked to write. And I think the reason for that is simple. Every one of you sitting here right now knows where we're coming from. The last few years we've been hammered as educators and teachers. Everyone has been hammered. All we're hearing is negativity. If I hear the word troika again, I'll go ballistic. If I hear the word cutback, if I hear this, and in education and in technology, there isn't a person in this room right now that doesn't have technology, hardware, human software, which has become deficited, which has become flatlined. And I wanted to thank profusely from my soul the SESI committee for asking poor Dahi to once again go onto a cross here and spark something which right now is very difficult to touch and taste in modern Ireland. I thought, how do I do this? What can I say to my colleagues here in front of me? Each one a genius in his and her own right, whether you like it or not. What can I say, what can I do? So, if I was to do my learning objective, Judy, God, there was a day you just came in with a bit of paper, wasn't it? Reminded me of the Gaeltacht once when the king walked into the classroom and said, Call on the plan, and where's your plans? And your man says, Earn the folly, earn the folly. They're on the whole time. That was a very good answer, actually, at that time. So I'm going to maybe look at where I think we're at right now, look at some ideas of what spark is in imagination, and then I'm going to go to that inflection point going to drive us out to 2050. And we all know we can't go beyond that. Why? Because with Moore's Law and everything happening, and the fact that the digital strategy, which I will leave to my esteemed colleagues, if I can deal with thereafter, there will be a wonderful sense of interaction and debate and discussion. I'm not going to go too much there, except to say that when I look at the European strategy, I suppose, for digital strategy that's out there, it's wonderful to see that we are not following we definitely are not following here. So what I would like to do is then look at that 2050 and then open your minds. And by the way, I have no problem with the Blues Brothers putting up the chicken wire. When you start to throw bottles at me, that means we're getting somewhere. But I'd like to start with this. Imagination is everything. It is the preview of life's coming attractions. Where are we right now? Can anyone tell me where we are? Give me one word. It begins with R and ends in Y. Reality. <laughs> nice one, no? <laughs> we'll talk later about being ready. <laughs> but reality. What does reality do? 
Reality is a bummer, isn't it? It kind of, oh man, you get up in the morning, you know you've got to go to court. Get up in the morning, you've got a section 29. Get up in the morning, you've got 2,000 kids in the hood. Who are basically going, I don't know. I don't know. And you're going, what don't you know? I don't know. <laughs> and you're trying to bring them into a 21st century environment where they can be soulful human beings, where they can transform. Instead of Star Trek the Borg, Resistance is futile. <laughs> you will be assimilated. And in technology, we've gone through that. Isn't it? Haven't we? We've gone through that. And we've traveled. We've traveled the world. We've been to the States. We've been to the craziest mountains in the world. We've met the funniest and most wonderful people. And the one thing they all have in common is by any other name, is soul and the recognition that change exists. Quo Vadis, so where are you going? Each one of us needs to ask this. Do we follow only a digital strategy? Do we go to the conference on the 30th and 31st of May and we all come together and we're all like little hens going to let's get this right? Or do we look at what we have? Every single child in front of us is our pension. <laughs> Don't teach them well. Learn them well. Minister, I have massive time for it. I have one problem. Coding is important. It is important that children understand these things. But in the 1980s, and I see my colleagues, my former colleagues from Mary Eye up there. In the 1980s, when a young gentleman called Marty Holland was around, and I had the privilege of designing a Sheena Fodder. Little did we realize when the Sheena Fodder was designed by basic programming of a VDU command, that nowadays localization would be such an important part of the equalization of technology. Technology doesn't care if you're cerebral palsy, if you're deaf, if you're blind, if you're a genius. It kind of goes and says, bring it on, baby. Come on, let me have it. And that's sparking the imagination. Don't ever be afraid of that stupid piece of hardware in front of you. Why? You control it. It doesn't control us. But I'm going to go to 2015 in a few moments, scare the hell out of some of you, hopefully. So where are you on this road? Are you with the trees? Are you on the road? Are you in the middle of the road? Are you driving on the right or the left-hand side of the road? Does it really matter? What is that road? Hopefully the digital strategy might show part of that road, but I hope there are trees in it. Here to Michael. I hope there are flowers. I hope there's a sense of underground revolution. I hope there's a sense of, go on, let's bring it on. Because if it isn't there, then we're dead. And it's a privilege to be with Ceci so often to come back every year for someone to give me just a pint of what's called sparking, sparking blood. And I want to thank the committee. But our insanity tells us that if we keep doing the same thing the same way every time, we're not going to get any different results. I was in a school recently where the kids were doing incredible stuff and I said to someone, will you open up and write me a letter in Microsoft Word? The kid looked at me and I went, oh man, I've got a Usain Bolt sprinter who never ran the local race out in Mulhuddert. Let's not forget where we've come from. The technology children have now is as good as dead. Is it the technology or is it the thought processes? Is it what we learn them instead of what we teach them? What are the things that formed each one of your lives? <coughs> Was it a sentence, a word? Was it a feeling? Very often what we give children is that sense of impossible is nothing. And that's what I love about technology. I'm not going to get into the fact that the most powerful tool in the world they hold in their hands and so many organizations prevent them from using this in school because we're afraid of it. Is they know more than us? Of course they do. <coughs> Don't ever let them know that though. <laughs> teacher, teacher, teacher. You're dead right. <laughs> teacher, you're wrong. I was trying to catch up. <laughs> Come on, if you haven't been there, then you haven't lived. And you turn around and go, whoa, that was close. That's what I love about the technology. Just use your imagination. That's all that SpongeBob tells us. 
Because when reality stops, imagination <coughs> begins. Thus, the spark ignites. I'm sorry to say that as a principal teacher, probably one of the largest schools in the country, no difference to Marion up there. Every day, reality kills. It's like a six inch nail into the back of the head. But when you get that chance in your office, and you sit in your throne, if you get a chance, your imagination begins. And Walter Mitty the film, have you seen it? You've got to see it. You've got to see it because it is a soul lifting experience to realize that in the 21st century, someone can actually do what he does in a world that otherwise wants to treat him as a dope, as a special needs human being. Deficit in the brain. Every human being is a genius. We just have to find it. There's no doubt in my mind that the illiterate of the 21st century are not those who can't perform STEM, who are not into numeracy and literacy. The 21st century illiterate are those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. Things we took for granted, those of you who are old enough to know, poor old Pluto. Where is she gone? Who the hell decided Pluto wasn't a planet? Who said it was just a poor old dog? Pluto is gone. Unlearn it. Congo. What Congo? Is it the Democratic Republic of Congo or Congo? The world is changing constantly as we sit here right now. Look at what's happening in Ukraine at this moment. Everything is changing. We need to unlearn every day. Yeah, we say to the kids, bell cat, see, yeah, the kick, 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 jolly phonics, come on, blah, 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 and we throw the words, and that's important. But the child can look at a computer, and the computer can have interactive sense of voice activated software. It can do so much now. How many of you have actually ever worn the Google glasses yet? Come on, surely someone has had them on. At the moment, I'm trialing them, because I'm back on Everest in November. I'm going for my second ascent of Everest. And they've asked me to wear the glasses. The only question I had was, will they crack if you're up at nearly 8,000 meters? And they said, no, we get, a, uh, we get a 3G communication. I said, I'm not worried about the bloody 3G communication. I'm worried about the 10,000 foot drop on the other side of the glasses. So I said, they can email you. I don't want to be reading emails when I'm running down the bloody mountain. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> By the way, did you bring a parachute down? You know, I forgot to have never packed it for me. <laughs> But when you wear it, you realize it's pervasive. And I'm going to go there in a while. Where are we? The junior search is gone, lads. Who remembers when it was the intercert? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's gone. But there is a campaign out there to bring it back, you know? Why would you bring it back? If you don't get your junior search, you're a failure. And then the kids come back in school, and then no one bothers about it. And the children spend all this time trying to get this result. And what are we putting in this place? Colleges of education are now going for four years to prepare teachers. <laughs> four years. What are we going to do in the fourth year? Recently at Dublin Castle, I asked that question. I got a bottle hopped off my head. I said, are we going to give them more verbal vomit, more ologies, or are we going to allow them to experience the journey of what teaching is educo? But that doesn't mean I lead. It means I can also be led. And technology is an incredible equalizer there. The questions we need to ask, so where are we? By 2050, the pace of tech change will reach, without doubt, the exponential inflection point. Up she pops. Based on Moore's law, I would say that man becomes one with machine. So let's look at the word humology. I'm a humalian, a human mixed with an alien, but my mother just never bothered to tell me that at the start. But I used to notice when at night these things came out of the back of her head, you know? Humology, that fusing of technology. How many of you have friends that can text two phones at the one time, can hold a conversation with you, and hear everything that's going around the place? That's what we call continuous partial attention. Stone came out with that, and I'll come back to that later on. The difference between that and multitasking. But when you see this happening, 
I often say, ah, there's great jobs for physiotherapists in the future here. <laughs> Repetitive strain injury. <laughs> I used to have one, two thumbs and four fingers, now I've just got four fingers. When you look at what they're doing, isn't it incredible? And this sparks my imagination because when it comes to the future, the further ahead we project ourselves, the more sci-fi it appears. Come on, Captain Kirk on the bridge. Who can remember him? Go back, back, back. What you see tap here? What has it become? Bluetooth. Man, wasn't Roddenberry so far ahead? When you look at Star Trek with Beam Me Up Scotty, I had the pleasure of being in MIT, talking in a room like this, and believe it or not, the worst thing in the world happened, a second die was re-particularized in a room down the way, and I went, oh man, get rid of that guy, he is dangerous. They were able to re-particularize my body in another room. Teachers are going, ah, there goes my job. <laughs> we'll just take one out of the college every year that gets the Veer Foster medal and put him or her into the school and we're away with it. <laughs> Trust me, it won't happen. <laughs> it won't happen. In the realm of future speculation, it is the further more distant future to me that becomes the most interesting thing. Imagination. Sparking that. Limitations only exist in our minds. But if we learn how to use imagination, the possibilities of our world become limitless. Limitless. There is nothing more powerful than your imagination. Look at that child on the back of the room. He's off daydreaming again. Ten years time, he set up a company that would be act out of its mind and make multi-millions. And you say to the child, can I have 10% of your company right now for a bar of chocolate? Oh, by the way, we have a healthy eating policy. Okay, the chocolate is 70% cocoa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, they're your pension. Do not castigate them. How many of you have heard of Joanne Cutcher Morenis? She envisioned the allosphere. How many of you have heard about the allosphere? It's where you now walk into this environment and you control everything that's working and it controls you. When you're in there, you have a total seven dimension existence. It's like a three story area where these scientists come in and they control so much interacting with the computer and everything is synchronously available globally as education tools and beyond. I suggest you Google the Allosphere and Joanne Cucero Morenis because it is so exciting to think that kids will be able to walk into a room anywhere. It doesn't have to be a room. Think beyond room. And we as teachers can create a constructionist environment. Constructionist dog. Constructivism, I like. Constructionism is it where children construct their own learning. The mathematicians among us know exactly what constructionism is. Many of us have to know that when we give something, when a child and a teacher interact equally in a the classroom, they can take something to a new level, another level. Ian knows what I'm talking about here. When I can take children with a passport and they can set up different DEF CON levels of your ability to speak to other children depending on what you have presented to a group from technology to show that you are allowed to come into an environment, then constructionism allows them to construct and build their own learning, which is symbiotic, which begins to evolve, and which in reality should not be stratified. It should be allowed to work. Because the children have something that we've lost a lot of, imagination. Brain-computer interfaces are massive right now. You can see that the robots that are coming from like to Japan and China, where we now have these robots that can do anything. And how many of you have actually had the implants? Or how many of you have had the pleasure of wearing any of these on your head, yet or your brain? I suppose where they come into main areas will be those who have had spinal injuries. Those that would have had major challenges like cerebral palsy, children with Down syndrome, where the brain can control a lot of their functions and where the communication can come from the brain-computer interfaces. This is now a reality in so many areas, but particularly in the area of medical and special needs. 
But this is where Google have gone with the glasses. This is where I believe social media is going. And we'll talk about that a little bit later again. The 4D immersive social media and interhuman digital browser. Have any of you been there yet? How many of you have been in town in Dublin where you've got into the 7D movie? Now, when you come out, trust me, I hope you haven't eaten dinner for about two hours beforehand. The movie is so 7D that there is nothing in it which you do not experience to the core of your six pack. Minister spoke about them going to the Amazon. This is why I'm going to wear the, the glasses. We're going to turn it into something that's beyond, where the children can actually feel, sense, smell, touch, enjoy, love, hate the experience of education. Let's not be afraid of this. Let's embrace it. Fortune favors the brave. The digital strategy, I take my hat off to on this because it is not afraid to go there. People may call us heretics, but that's okay. This morning we were called disciples. We don't have a Judas, do we? <laughs> if we do, can I have 30% of the 30 pieces of silver? <laughs> but locally stored, cloud-based and interhumanoid-based activities in a 4D immersive motion application and beyond. This is real in education, where the children can go in there. So when we talk about children with special needs, children with forms of dyslexia, dyspraxia, dysarthrographia, autism and all of this, the children in there will all find their level to be able to experience education. No, they may not get 600 points in the leaving circuit. But they will be what Plato said, and it was a privilege to be here in 2009 to speak about this. They will have the soul of being part of citizenship within our society. And to know the technology will give them every advantage. So where are we? I suppose in 2050, it's my contention, there are no frontiers now, but there will be no frontiers. And in looking at that, we ourselves will be fused one with global society. There is no difference. We are part of this. Right now, many of you are doing it. I know that Simon and Anshad.ie and beyond, this is what you're doing right now, Raj. You're way out there. And so many others, I know. But look, you're, you're just so far out there right now. It worries me. You know? It worries me. It's OK, though. Like a cycling, I'm just getting behind you. And you cut 20% off what's happening there. And so many others out there are doing this. I call it learning to learn together apart. Nowadays, when you go into a classroom, if you've been supervised by a facilitator, they look to see plans, notes, working, individual groups, collaboration, communities, all working together. But what's wrong with the child who wants to learn to learn together and apart? What's wrong with that? Do great minds think alike? Do they? No, they bloody don't. <laughs> if great minds thought alike, then every Irish man would marry a wonderful Irish woman. <laughs> That's why they think alike. <laughs> That's not a racist comment, by the way. <laughs> Great minds never thought alike. They never thought alike. That is why the excitement is there. <coughs> Teachers, do not be part of the rat race. The curricula allow us to imagine the impossible. Reality kicks you into 600 points. The future is the now. STEM is real. Strategies are there. But we can allow the children to create their own learning in these environments, utilizing the technologies which are theirs. Because the overall challenge of tomorrow's knowledge society is to go beyond the mobile digital information communication technologies. It's to go beyond that. And they're already there, the kids, because most of them don't live in reality. How many of you can tell me the top five things in a child's life that you can recall right now? If you think of any child you teach or work with, who can recall the top three or four or five things in their lives? We might think we know it, but very often we don't. That's our generation gap. The global challenge is 
charging us and challenging us to go creative, to become innovative, to change the psyche in education. Please, the colleges of education, in your fourth year of primary teaching, please, in the Erasmus Plus programs, which are offering 27 million, please allow our people, our citizens, our educators to experience the spark of imagination of the impossibility of possibility of technology. Please allow them to experience this without going in and ticking boxes. This is the challenge to not be afraid. Humans are powerful, technologies are powerful, together they are mythetically powerful. Those who've heard me speak before know the word mythetics comes from Greek. It means lesson mathema. It became mathematics logical, but in Mayan and in Arabic, it means breathing life into the art of learning. So let us breathe life into the art of learning with pedagogy. We put too much emphasis on the pedagogy. Yes, it's important. No, we don't throw the baby out with the bath water. But how many of your mothers have ever said, that child's been here before? <laughs> well, you want to go beyond certain religions, you realize they probably were. But we're not going to go there today. No, no, I've already stuck my foot in it once. <laughs> so, what's happening? No one knows anything, really. But the most profound technologies, I believe, are those that are fused so naturally into our existence that they are invisible. And this is what has happened in many schools. The technology is a natural part of the curriculum which is in there. It's a natural part of what happens in there. But very often when the WSE happens, there I say it, many of the Kigari do not realize how powerful it is. And Ceci has done so much over so many years to put this forward, to spark that imagination. I wish sometimes that those who are supervising us would realize how much work and soul we're putting into this. So where do we go? I think at this particular moment, diverging paths for humans and transhumans, eco-technic societies dominate the globe. Colonialization of space is beginning in earnest now. This is what's happening. That space station up there, how many of you saw gravity? Get the hell up fast, guys, because trust me, once this world is gone, they're up there. So who's going to throw the first bottle? I think this is now the beginning of something wonderful. Global web-based technologies are going to become the center of gravity. More and more. You've got all the social media buying up all the apps. They're trying to get us all into this immersive environment. They want children to become more immersed in the technologies, in the games, in the simulations, in the possibilities. I would say our role is to allow them to think beyond the technologies and to allow it to debate, to think together, to create thought processes. Give them an investment in the future. Give them more than just the normal, I suppose, teaching. Mobile eye technologies, the incitive, intellectual, the internationalization of technologies, that will dictate the reality of global society. There will be super organisms of smart biometric computing like the glasses that we have right now in the Google, like the sense of the robotics which are happening, the sense that we will be connected at all times. What I will call later on, continuous partial attention. The web beings, which is us, with synchronous mobile communication built into us 24-7. Sure, most of us have that already. Can I ask you a question? Please ask yourself, don't put your hands up. How many of you turn your phone off at night? How many of you actually turn your digital communication devices off at night? How many of you meditate each day and turn it off? <laughs> and then you get, oh my god, where were you for the last five minutes? I was ringing you. Kind of idea. Okay, man, okay, right, you know. It has become pervasive, hasn't it? It really has. There's been an increased, I believe, globalized humanity. And yes, there is climate change. There are dwindling resources. There is going to be overpopulation. And there will be technological upheaval. 
Whether we like it or not, that's going to happen, because that inflection point is going to come. By the way, by 2050, I hope I'm well gone at that point, so it won't bother me. But for some of you young ones down there, get on the flak jackets right now and start preparing for it. Or go over to Elizabeth and study maths and Trinity and know what that inflection point is all about. Information overload will become commonplace. Have any of you been at that stage right now where you're getting so many emails, so many texts, so much happening that you just feel, wow, it's happening, isn't it? It's happening. Wild cards such as nanotechnologies and Infinitropics, which is the software, they're going to take things in completely unexpected directions. Really exciting what's going to happen here. The possibility, again, like I told you, of people with major physical injuries, mental challenges, those who will have disabilities, being able to connect in. Continuous partial attention, now I'm going to come, is a must behavior to survive. Let's explain. If you were doing 10 jobs at the one time, people call that productivity. And you want to finish the 10 jobs at the one time so that you're actually occupied. Okay? Continuous partial attention is where you have those 10 jobs and you are connected through them so that they are equally being taken care of at the one time. I.e., how are things going? That's already going to No, definitely not. So take care. But you are connected equally to all of them. Stone talks about this continuous partial attention. I know you're busy. Worth reading up on the web. Worth seeing the difference between being preoccupied by 10 things that are killing us and being connected to so much. Because in order to survive the overload pace of life, I think it would be vital that we will be able to connect <coughs> equally, but to choose our connections so that our soul and our spirituality will be always to the front. And in the young child, that's what sparks my imagination. A child can do that. And I basically would say, why? Because they'll say, don't know. And I love that. How many of you have said to someone, hello, principal, I want you to do this, 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 this. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, have you ever done this to a parent when they come in and go, don't know. <laughs> Imagine the shock in their face. It's the one thing they don't expect, but in reality, that's real, isn't it? Because sometimes you go, I don't know. <laughs> Just leave me alone. And in college, don't be afraid to put your hand up, those of you who are here students and say to the lecture, I don't know. <laughs> it's important. Being connected is accepted, but I maintain there's going to be a huge intrusion on our privacy. And that would be virtually non-existent. Living spaces would be web controlled and would be, as they are now, accessible globally. Has anyone yet had the pleasure of being able to turn on their heating from the car? Come on, there's probably someone here who's got that technology. We can turn on your heating and open the door and turn off the alarm. It's there. It's all real. It's what's happening. That's what's sparking it. The holistic, meaningful, and soulful human being is challenged to find meaning in a multicultural world, wholly connected, without the desire to embrace traditional conformity. We are going to be put into such places which very often will take us out of our comfort zone. So I say again, when reality stops, imagination is born. Maybe Walter Mitty hasn't got it so wrong. But in the world of technology, we can make that productive. Seeking self and meaning will be challenging. It will be so challenging in the virtuality and the super technologies because the technology will offer you happiness. We can offer you longevity. We can rebuild you. Is there anyone here old enough to remember the old Colgate ad? That's my grandmother. The only thing that are real are her teeth. <laughs> Maybe that's not so far off with technology that we will always be forever young. Maybe Tinkerbell had it right. <coughs> What was Walt Disney's famous statement? Don't forget, guys, it all began with a mouse. It all began with a mouse. And yet no one has received more Academy nominations than Walt Disney. No one has received more. But yet it all began with a mouse. I suppose this is what I want to look at here. We're very much there, aren't we? 
There's a company outside called Mission V. Later on today, Ceci have put a group together. To be with Mission V and to walk through Clonmac Nyes with an Oculus headset on us, and to be able to look up and down and sense the whole essence, mathematically, geographically, archaeologically, <coughs> architecturally, and to be able to do this in a classroom with an Oculus headset on was such a privilege. And later on today, when the groups come together, I suggest you stay on to watch this, to see the reality of non sick movement, Oculus headsets that can take us into learning environments where everything is equalized. And this is what we're looking at here. Teaching as we know it will be multi-rolling. It will facilitate the individual, the self-directed, that constructionist learning in all environments. It will allow every human being, irrespective of his or her challenge, to be equal in the environment. Laughter is timeless. Imagination has no age. Dreams are forever. Barker in 1988 in New York had the pleasure of saying, action with vision will change the world. Action without vision is a waste of time. Vision without action is only a dream. And I'd love to have said to him in 88 if I had the wisdom, what's wrong with dreaming? <coughs> what's wrong with dreaming? Look at your man, he's only a dreamer. He may be a dreamer, she may be a dreamer. But when you look that dreams are forever, this is what we ought not to be afraid of. To finish in many ways, I have the pleasure of reading at the moment a book called Spiritual Intelligence in the Workplace. I never in my life thought I'd see a book like this. The story would be, how to do it. <laughs> Ten steps of being the better teacher. De Bono says, that's right. <laughs> the child in the hood says, oh no. <laughs> when you look at a book like this and you realize spiritual intelligence, and you look at Gardner's multiple intelligences, and you look at what's happening, is there not an existential intelligence? Is there not an extraterrestrial intelligence? What is intelligence? To wrap up in lots of ways, to again thank the SESI committee for being crazy enough to ask me to come and speak about spark the imagination. I maintain in our times of difficulty now as educators, and it is difficult, the one thing they cannot take from us, and think of the film 300, what are we? Spartans. Woo, woo. And that's what we are. Every day that we go out there, we are Spartans. And there will always be crazy, you see, I can't say Greeks because they might think that's an insult, but you know from the film, there will always be crazy people who will try to bury us. There will always be those who will say, another digital strategy. Dear, haven't you got better things to be doing with your life? And Michael, what are you <coughs> up to? And there will be people saying, Minister, what's the point of a meeting on the 30th and 31st of May? What are you going to achieve? We're in schools where the rooms are falling apart. We can't afford toilet paper. The priest is on. No, no, we'll go there. There's so many different things happening during the year. The poor teachers are basically taking six spoons of coffee every morning in their cup. The sugar is running out by such time because they can't get enough in because we are killing them. When you walk into a room, and I love that ad, when they're in the library and everyone comes in for tea and everyone starts screaming, and then they go back out. What's screaming in you? What is it that keeps you going every day? And if you can't find that, then please shut down your reality for a minute. And go into imagination. And imagine what would you like to create for your classroom, for your audience, for your lecture room today. And how can you embrace the humology of technology so that imagination is timeless? And what can you give to those people in front of you 
that has longevity. And it is this, impossible is nothing. Do not be assimilated. Let no one tell you that the technology of now is what it will be, because it's not real. The conference today and the wonderful names I see in front of me and the presentations excite me. I know Steve is back again. He's probably going to go, well, get off the bloody thing, on Morocco. I wasn't as long as you. That's OK. And you look at what Neil is doing in ODS, the open discovery space right now in Europe, and what that's challenged us to do. And a new group in Dublin I hear called Pictour. What I like about it is the last two letters in it, Ur, <coughs> which means fresh. I know that's happening right now, and I know it's happening around the country. And Ceci have tried so hard, so often, to put together groups around the country to bring them together. But when you look at the presentations today, Adrian, and I want to compliment the whole of the, C the Ceci committee here, because there's so much happening here. There's so much working with the names, with the future, with the reality of practice. But please, in all of this, if you went out of here with one thing this morning, it's this. Get rid of reality every now and again. That means the boyfriend, the girlfriend, too, sometimes, you know. But it then means create the imagination. As they say, follow that. Dahi, thank you very, very much for that. Um, I knew we picked well when we asked Dahi to give us our keynote. I'm left breathless. I look forward to thinking upon much of what has been said. I wrote down many things, but the one thing that I starred is read life into the art of learning. Thank you very much, Dahi. We could have a round of applause again for you.